I think the best way to approach this is just kind of give you an idea of the scale of what's going on. In the post-Cold War environment, with the the advent of hyper-globalization, it, it used to be in, well, let me back up, pre-World War II, everything was imperial. And if you had iron ore and steel and food and coal, you could try to make something of yourself. And if you weren't, you were probably a colony. But with globalization post-1945, you now only needed one of those things. And you could trade for the others. And the whole world started to industrialize and urbanize. As we urbanized, we moved into the cities and people started taking manufacturing jobs. And, you know, that generated growth and specialization and education and health and all the other things that we associate with the modern world. But when you're on a farm, you have lots of kids because they're free labor. You move into the city, you have like 1.2. And so we have been in a stage of ever accelerating population crashes now in parts of the world for 75 years. In the post-Cold War environment, when you know, the end of history happened, everything about globalization and the Cold War kicked into high gear, and the countries that had not embraced it yet did. And most of the economic growth we have experienced globally since 1990 has been about metabolizing assets and countries and populations and resources that were not involved before 1990. And that is roughly half of the world. Uh, and this is the story of the Brazilian agricultural explosion or the Russian commodities explosion or the Chinese manufacturing explosion. But it was all happening against the backdrop of that demographic collapse. When you stop having kids, at first you generate a lot of growth. Because if you're in your 20s and your 30s and you have no kids, you're not spending money on diapers and school. You're spending it on cars and condos. It's a lot more high octane. And you get the growth story we've seen in the developing world, especially in China. But when you then are in your 50s, where they are now, the growth stops because you've got everything that you need. And when you retire, it all stops completely. So what we're seeing now in the 2020s is a lot of the world has aged into this point where the growth story is over and the production story is over and there isn't a story moving forward. So we've had 35 years roughly of the greatest economic growth in the most open system in the world, but it was never more than a geopolitical and a demographic moment in time. And this decade, it was always going to end. And it can be sped up, and we're seeing that now. COVID sped it up. The Ukraine war is speeding it up. The complete descent of China into narcissistic cult of personality, not narcissism, is speeding it up. And we are looking at the end of the world that we understand in probably the next 36 months. Uh, not all countries are created equal. Not all demographics are structured the same. So if you're in a position where you're today's 50-somethings actually had kids, so there's a replacement generation, you know, you're not having a consumption crisis. If anything, you might be having a, a inflation because of consumption. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here in the United States. If you are on a chunk of geography where you're physically secure, then if global trade breaks down, you really don't have a problem. And so for the United States, only 12% of GDP is involved in international trade, but half of that is in NAFTA. Whereas for the Chinese, the number is closer to 40%. Uh, and that includes uh, the mass import of the energy they need to keep the lights on and the food they need to keep the population alive. So, you know, obviously you interfere with international trade and China ceases to exist as an entity. Uh, so there will definitely be relative winners and relative losers. But if you are a firm that is involved in international trade, yeah, there's not a lot about this that looks great. Unless, of course, your footprint is in Mexico, in which case, hot damn, you're probably in the best spot in the world. Right. Yeah, um, it's, um, and it's difficult to overstate just how screwed China is. If you back up to before COVID... They were the most exposed country in the world in terms of energy and food security. They get their stuff from at least a half a continent away, typically more than a continent away. And they are utterly dependent upon the U.S. Navy to keep the trade lanes open in order to access some of those materials. And then they're utterly dependent upon the Americans keeping their market open to sell their end-odd product to. So every stage of the... Chinese economic model is dependent not simply on American quiescence, but American actu America actually empowering the Chinese system to succeed. And between the kind of disconnected populism of Trump and the more active nationalism, I'm sorry, the more the kind of disconnected populism of Obama, the more active nationalism of Trump, and now the the bureaucratic 
economic populism of Biden, every piece of the support network that keeps China going is being challenged at the same time. At the same time that the Biden administration has killed their tech sector, at the same time that they've become completely dependent on Russian energy, which whether it's coming from the West or the East is at its peak and can only go down from here because the technical workers that are necessary to keep it going are no longer there. At the same time, their demographics have collapsed with even the Chinese now admitting that they overcounted their population by 100 million people aged 40 and under. At the same time that Xi has completely destroyed all information reporting within the country in order to further his cult of personality. So we are on the verge of a catastrophic, spectacular Chinese collapse. Uh, uh, I would argue at this point that any money that is in China is already lost. Uh, If you own a fixed asset there, your best chance is that the Chinese are going to confiscate it, but let your managers go. But with the protest that started Thanksgiving week in the United States, uh, there is really only two paths here. I mean, number one is in a cult of personality system where all policies start with one person. When you protest a policy, (laughs) you're protesting the leader. And we saw the protests evolve in that direction in a matter of days with people directly challenging the competence of their dear leader. Uh, If that is allowed to spin out of control, that tears the entire system down. And China has collapsed a number of times in the past because of that sort of popular uprising. Or we get a nationwide Tiananmen style crackdown for political reasons. Um, Neither of these good is good. Neither of these outcomes is good for investment or manufacturing. And if it's the second one, uh, anyone with a foreign link is going to be immediately seen as a, a security threat, and they will be treated appropriately. Oh. When the war began, the Ukrainians had been preparing for eight years, but preparing with very limited resources, and they had had a problem with the Americans under Trump because Trump had stopped all military assistance to Ukraine. If you remember back to the impeachment hearings, it was Trump's ability to blackmail Zelensky. That's where it all started. And so when Biden came in, he started the aid back up. And when the uh, when the javelins started reaching the front line around last Thanksgiving, roughly, that is when the Russians decided, okay, we need to, we need to move. And the, the troop buildup started. But for the first six months of the war, the Ukrainians were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. They were completely dependent upon foreign tech and foreign equipment to make things run. Uh, the, the, the change in the math occurred in August and September with the Kharkiv offensive. And in 36 hours, the Ukrainians captured the city of Izium, which had been the Russian primary forward staging base. And they captured it intact. And in that one 36-hour period, the Ukrainians captured more Russian tanks and artillery than they began the war with. Uh, More tanks and artillery than NATO had transferred to them in the war to that point. And then the Battle of Kyrgyzstan happened a few weeks after that, and they got a haul that was nearly as large. So they're going to need the winter to do a lot of deferred maintenance and get this Russian stuff back into operation. And you add that to the 60-odd thousand Ukrainian troops that are training abroad on new weapon systems that are not yet in theater, (coughs) and just the general advancement of the military quality back home. And by the time we get to the end of mud season in May, it's going to be a very different military on the Ukrainian site. We're not probably going to see a huge amount of maneuvering in mud season. So you can kind of split the the conflict period into four periods in a year in Ukraine. You've got the hard winter when everything's frozen, where you can maneuver fine. You've got the summer when you can maneuver and everything is fine. But on the shoulders in the spring and the fall, when it's cold, but not cold enough to freeze the ground, you get this thick mud in the step, and then you really can't operate with tanks. We get to the other side of mud season. The Ukrainians are going to have a couple hundred thousand men operating equipment more advanced than they've ever had. And it's going to be a very different sort of army. On the Russian side, there's going to be at least a half a million new men on the front lines, perhaps as many as a million. And by the time we get to the end of June, we're going to know 
whether this is a Sparta or an Athens situation as to who's going to win. Now, we will not be done by the end of June. This, this war is still going to drag on, but it'll be very clear who's got the momentum and who is capable of striking the knockout blows in the long run. Another thing to watch for is just in the last few days, the Ukrainians have been launching some long-range drones several hundred miles into Russia. They will probably be able to get that into a degree of mass production by the time we get to May. And then we're talking about supply supply chain systems and logistical issues for the Russians, not just in Ukraine proper, but all the way back to the point of manufacture. 